Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by the Institute of Navigation titled Improved GPS-Based Single Frequency Orbit Determination for the Cygnus Spacecraft Using Gypsy X. Based on a paper published in the Spring 2023 issue of Navigation, the Journal of the Institute of Navigation. This paper can be downloaded in its entirety from the Navigation Open Access website at navi, that's N-A-V-I dot I-O-N dot org where you can read, download, cite, and share valuable research such as this paper. Today's webinar is presented by Alex Conrad, one of the paper's authors. Alex Conrad is a PhD student in aerospace engineering sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. He received a BS degree in astronautical engineering from Arizona State University and MS in aerospace engineering sciences from the University of Colorado Boulder in 2020. He recently defended his thesis and expects to graduate in the next few months. Congratulations. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at ion.org and on our YouTube channel. Following Alex's presentation, we'll accept questions from the audience. You can submit your questions at any time by text using the Q&A button in your viewer. Thank you for joining us here. We'll now turn the time over to soon to be Dr. Alex Conrad. Alex, over to you. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I would first just like to thank my uh, co-authors, starting with my advisor, uh, Penny Axelrad, as well as Chinzia Zufata and Bruce Haynes at JPL and Andrew O'Brien at The Ohio State University. So just to give you an overview of my presentation today, I'm first just going to give you some background on the Cygnus mission, what its primary mission is, and what we are um, using it for. And then following that, an evaluation of Cygnus orbit or, or methods for evaluation of the Cygnus orbit errors using GRACE as an analog. And then getting into some of the orbit background models that we're applying, as well as our solution strategies. And then finally, um, we'll show you the main results here, which is a comparison of Cygnus and GRACE internal metrics, followed by an, um, an evaluation of the GRACE POD errors and what those implications are for Cygnus. So the Cygnus mission, it's a constellation of eight 6U small sats, each of which are equipped with GNSSR reflectometry receivers. So these are able to measure reflections off the um, surface of the Earth. And then from that, they look at the scatter of those GPS signals to try and determine the sea surface wind speed in hurricane conditions. So as part of that mission, the it doesn't need precise orbits. And so all that is available is the navigation solution from the onboard receiver, which has 3D position errors on the order of three meters. But given that these reflected GPS signals also contain delay information, there's, all, there's interest to use these signals to estimate the sea surface height. But the orbit errors from this noisy navigation solution will map into the altimetry retrievals. And for this reason, in order to, to perform GNSSR altimetry, precise orbits are required. And really the study here is part of a larger goal of understanding and quantifying the errors associated with GNSS altimetry to better inform future missions. Where, where here we're just specifically looking at the, how the accuracy of the achievable orbits with a, the single frequency receiver. So like I mentioned, the, the motivation here is really to sub study the feasibility of single frequency precise orbit determination specifically in the Gypsy X software. So the overall goal here is to improve the Cygnus orbits and then quantify the errors associated with those orbits and, and, and really try to figure out a way to understand, you know, how precise and how accurate they are and what is it suitable for GNSSR altimetry research. The issue here, of course, is that Cygnus is a fairly low cost mission and there's no independent metrics. So like dedicated altimetry missions will have things like satellite laser ranging, which you can use to as an independent metric to evaluate the overall orbit solution, but we don't have anything like this with Cygnus. And so because of that, what we've chosen to do is, is use GRACE as an analog, right? And you can see, like I've shown just pictures of each of the spacecraft, right? These are very different missions where GRACE does require, you know, very precise orbits. And it's also, you know, it has a dedicated uh, GNSS receiver that is suitable for that application where, where the, the direct signal receiver on Cygnus, it's just primarily for the navigation solution only. 
And so really what we want to do is like, is understand, you know, how feasible is precise over determination um, with a low cost um, receiver for scientific applications. So I mentioned the GRACE um, as an analog here. And, and what we are using GRACE for is a method for evaluating our solution strategies with Cygnus. So GRACE can be, you know, because its primary mission is to map the time variable and mean gravity field of the Earth, it requires precise orbits. And given that it's dual frequency, so it can remove the ionosphere and, it, and um, single, re uh, single receiver ambiguity resolution is possible, GRACE can achieve orbit accuracies of a few centimeters, right? This is, this is much more accurate than what we would expect to get with a single frequency receiver alone. And, and because of that, we can treat these GRACE orbits as truth, right? So they can be used to then compare against single frequency POD strategies. And then from this, we can then understand the errors associated with GRACE single frequency POD, and then extend this to Cygnus and, and um, try to determine what the implications are for Cygnus um, from the GRACE single frequency errors. So just to give you a comparison of these two spacecraft, they have similar um, orbiting altitudes, you know, close to 500 kilometers for each. They are in very different inclinations, though, where GRACE is a polar orbit, and Cygnus, because its primary mission is like wind speed in, in the tropics for hurricanes, its, its inclination is only 35 degrees. GRACE has a, you know, geodetic quality blackjack GPS receiver, um, whereas Cygnus um, has an SSTL resi receiver. Grace also has a choke ring antenna to, to reduce the noise and, and you know, increase the quality of the measurements, whereas Cygnus just has a, has a dual patch receiver. Um, we are using the original Grace mission, and so there was no overlap with Cygnus with that, um, but we do select the year 2009, which is similar in the solar cycle, so we should expect similar ionosphere effects between the, the, the two. All right, now getting into some of the methods here. So like I mentioned before, um, we are using exactly the same observations on both. So GRACE and Cygnus both use the GPS L1CA code and phase measurements. GRACE also has the, the PY observation, but we are not using those for this study so that we have CA code on both um, spacecraft. So just to give you just a very broad overview of GNSS-based um, POD, um, for our solutions, the, the GNSS orbit and clock products are fixed. We use the JPL final products. So these are, these are brought into the solution. And the solution is initialized with a reference trajectory. So the reference trajectory is, is a fit to the onboard navigation solution. And that provides you with initial conditions from which you can then linearize your, your um, observation model about. From that, you can then feed it into the filter, the least square solver, and then you can update the initial conditions. You can iterate on that several times. Um, oftentimes we'll do this because we want to apply post-fit residual windows so we can exclude residuals that are outliers from, from the next solution. And then finally, um, once you're satisfied with your solution, you can do this, the solution assessment. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things we can do there, since that is really one of the primary focuses here. Additionally, we are also looking at the measurement model aspect of things, in part because we are applying antenna calibrations within the filter, and I'll also talk a little bit more about that in, in a few slides. So some of our orbit and background models, um, like I mentioned before, we're using the GYPSYX software, and this is developed by JPL um, to process space geodetic data for positioning, navigation, and timing. It really is a highly configurable um, software suite with high fidelity dynamical models, including things like um, time variable gravity, ocean tides. And then we also have um, uh, things like solar radiation pressure forces modeled um, using a custom macro model, as well as uh, atmospheric density for drag um, coefficient. It also has the ability to use reduced dynamics, which are completely user configurable, both in how they're applied and you know, the stochastic method in which they're updated. 
as well as the ability to estimate antenna calibrations directly within the filter. So this means that you can, and we do this in dynamic orbits, not the reduced dynamic, you can augment the, the filter state with the antenna calibration vertices and estimate them um, simultaneously with your orbit solution clock and everything together. So I mentioned the orbit solution evaluation. And, and one of the, the most common metrics here are orbit overlaps. So we process for each day 30 hour arcs. So centered at noon, this results in six hours of overlap at midnight for each day processed. From the overlap period, we compute the component differences in radial, cross track, and in track from the central four hours. From those differences, you then can um, compute a single RMS statistic for a single overlap period. And then over time with different overlap periods, you can then get an idea of how, um, how precise or repeatable your solution strategy is. So this is one of the primary metrics that we'll be using um, to evaluate the, the precision of the solution, but grace is what we'll be using to try and evaluate the accuracy. So for L1 orbit processing, you know, the primary challenge here is, is how do we deal with the single frequency ionosphere that's in both the code and the phase um, observations? And for this study, we've selected two different methods. The first one is a code only orbit processing um, orbit solution. And the other one is something called graphic, which is essentially the average of the code plus phase. So graphic stands for group and ionosphere phase or group and phase ionosphere correction. And I'll and I'll show you a little bit more about graphic on the next slide. But both of these solutions, we are processing them in a reduced dynamic approach with iteration. So we do a first a dynamic pass followed by a reduced dynamic pass. For the code only solution, we do use an ionosphere um, correction um, for the ionosphere delays. And we also correct for some of the differential code biases that occur between the the CA observation in the clock product. So like I mentioned before with the, with the graphic, um, and here I'm showing you a little bit more detail. So as most of you probably know, the code and phase have equal but ionosphere or equal but opposite ionosphere effects. So when you take the average of the code plus phase, you remove the ionosphere, but you're left with an observable that still has half the integer ambiguity as well as half the, the code noise. So you have benefited from removing the ionosphere, but you now have the integer ambiguity associated with the phase and half the code noise associated with the code. Um, so when we use this within the filter, we have to treat it like a phase observable. Um, we do include the clock because it, you know, with this phase ambiguity, there's no um, anchor to the clock solution. So you do include the code to anchor the clock, but it's heavily deweighted so that it does not significantly affect the, the graphic uh, orbit solutions. Now, one of the issues we had with um, Cygnus that we noticed early on was that the, the Cygnus carrier phase contains a clock-like error that is not consistent with the pseudo range. So in this, uh, in this plot on the upper left, this is just showing for a single pass, the code minus carrier. And you can see that, you know, you would expect this to be, you know, dominated by two times the, the ionosphere since, but instead we see something that has a lot of structure in it and it diverges much more rapidly than we would expect due to ionosphere, you know, so over 20 minutes, you know, like 250 meters divergence. If we detrend both the code and the phase, we can see that um, this structure is within the phase and not the code. Additionally, if we process both of these separately down here over a single day, we can see that they, they end up with very different um, clock solutions where the code here is you know, relatively consistent, near zero, indicative of, a, of the receiver being, um, the, the receiver clock being steered, but in the phase, we have this very large slope that also contains all that structure if we zoom in on it. So before applying the graphic solution, we need to correct this clock-like error in the phase um, because it, it, it causes these timing errors cause the overlaps to be significantly degraded in the in-track direction. So without correcting for this, the graphic would at times have overlap 
in track RMS values well over a meter, which is which is much worse than we want or would expect. So to correct for it, the first thing we we do is we use code minus carrier. So this removes the common clock term between the two signals, but it's it leaves two times the ionosphere and as well as the the phase um, integer ambiguity as well as this phase clock-like term. If we then take the first difference, we can get rid of the integer ambiguity, and then we're left with you know, two times the ionosphere change, two times the change in the noise, and uh, the change in this phase clock-like term. So if you do this across all the simultaneously tracked arcs, you get the orange dots on the plot up here. Um, so, as long as like the change in the ionosphere between all simultaneously arcs, it, you know, is is near zero, right? We can then use the median value and reconstruct the clock, um, the phase like clock error recursively. So we do use the median because the change in ionosphere for some can be much larger. So the median works a little better here. This correction is not going to be perfect, um, but really what we needed to do is is over the long term to not diverge, right? To stay near zero in, in the long term. All right, so now just a, a quick overview of our solution strategies. So these solution strategies are applied um, exactly the same for every orbit solution that I'm going to show you. So that includes the Cygnus code-only solution, Cygnus graphic solution, as well as Grace code-only and Grace graphic solution. Each solutions apply an antenna calibration that is estimated within the dynamic solution using only that particular observable. So a code only calibration estimated in a code only dynamic solution. Um, for our final orbits, we use a reduced dynamic solution where we apply or we estimate an, um, a dynamic pass that includes a drag coefficient and then once per revs cross track and in track in which the amplitudes are constant over the 30 hour data set. That is followed by a reduced dynamic pass in which we add stochastics for the once per revs, as well as um, constants for the cross track radial and in track. And um, we use uh, update intervals of 30 minutes and correlation time of six hours. So this allows you to, um, to fit the measurements better than, you know, to account for mismodeled um, dynamics and to uh, take advantage of the slowly changing um, effects that occur. So as I mentioned before, this is done for two separate solutions, the code only and the graphic. So now moving to the results. And the first thing I'm going to look at here are the antenna calibrations and then followed by some of the internal metrics. So the daily residual RMS and orbit overlaps. So the antenna calibration, um, is, is shown here for both um, Grace and Cygnus. This top plot is for Grace. And on the left here, we have the code only calibration. And on the right, we have the graphic. Um, note the scale here. So because we expect you know, the graphic to have half the code um, noise and, and multi-path effects, I've, I've put the scale at, for the graphic half of the code. And you can see that um, for grace, that the variability is, you know, it's only plus or minus 20 centimeters here. It's a really clean environment for the graphic. When we look at the grace, though, we can see that it doesn't, it, you know, it looks like there's a lot more going on here at the low elevation. And this is likely due to um, residual ionosphere errors being absorbed in the code only solution. If we go down to Cygnus here for the code only, um, rather than you know here where it's plus or minus 40 centimeters, it's now plus or minus two meters. So there's a lot more variability with the Cygnus um, antenna calibration than for Grace. This isn't surprising given you know the you know the difference between a choke ring antenna versus a patch antenna. Um, whereas, and if we look at the graphic, we can see they look very very similar, and likely you know the 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 size of the effects here is still large enough that the ionosphere, you know, residual ionosphere isn't, isn't as obvious for Cygnus. Um, interestingly, we did have anechoic chamber measurements for um, Cygnus in a, in a mock-up that uh, we were able to, you know, cap compute a, a, a group delay for the Cygnus calibration. And, and it is very similar to what we get in flight um, for the code. Um, 
but you can see there are subtle differences. So it is better to estimate it in flight because you're going to be able to capture that in-flight environment more accurately. Um, but it is kind of nice to see that they do agree quite well. All right, moving on to the, to the daily residual RMS. So within these plots, these are histograms of, of the daily um, residual RMS statistics. And then in the table, I've plotted essentially the mean value of each of these uh, histograms, as well as like the standard deviation across. So if we look at Cygnus down here, um, we can see that uh, as, it, you know, as we would expect that the code only is roughly twice the graphic um, residual RMS. So given that graphic should have half the code noise, this seems in pretty good agreement. However, if we look at Grace, we can see Grace has graphic residual RMS of three and a half centimeters. So th this would be indicative of code noise on the order of seven centimeters. Um, I, think, I think this is in part because there is onboard smoothing of the code, but this doesn't really agree with fully with, you know, with code um, uh, residuals of 28 centimeters for Grace. This is, um, this is primarily due to the remaining errors in the ionosphere and potential differential code bias corrections, where because the code noise is so low for Grace, these have a much bigger impact on the final code um, residuals than they do for Cygnus, where you know, these get a little bit drowned out for Cygnus. Um, so it, it, it's a more obvious signal for Grace. All right, looking now at the overlap. So, the first thing we notice here, so we have, have grace on the left and the code only is in blue with the graphic in, in the orange. And for all components, the radial, cross track and in track, graphic has, you know, is significantly more precise. And not only is it more precise, it actually has much less variability from day to day. If we um, look at this now compared to um, Cygnus, we can see that um, this is also true for Cygnus, but it's not as pronounced. It is it is less um, it is it is less impactful here, but it is still a improvement. Um, just a second, try and remove or move a. There we go. Um, whereas um, right, so so we definitely see much more precise orbits for both Grace and Cygnus in the graphic solution. Um, we can see that uh, the most significant improvement for for uh, Cygnus is in the cross track, where we have you know much more precise, going from six point two centimeter average to one point two, with with a large reduction in the in the overall standard deviation of the overlap um, RMS values um, from two point six to point four, and that is notable in part because there are some issues with the cross track that will come up later. All right, so now we're, we can examine um, the GRACE uh, POD errors. Um, given that we have validated orbits, which we expect to be much more accurate than our single frequency orbit solutions, we can compare directly against those. So looking first at the overall biases. So, so what I've done is I've, I've compared the daily solutions in terms of radial, cross-track, and in-track components um, as a daily bias and a daily RMS. So if we look at the biases, the radial and cross track are quite small, you know, both for the code only and the graphic solutions, you know, sub centimeter. The code only does have larger or more variable uh, biases, um, which is improved by the graphic. You know, so you can see down here on the, on the, on the plots, um, or on, on the table, sorry. Um, if we look at the overall um, error RMS, though, we can see that there's a significant improvement for all three components, um, both in terms of the average error RMS, as well as the daily um, spread across that. So really, there's, there's um, right, the, the biggest difference here is really how, how much more consistent the errors are with the graphic for Grace. And so... The main takeaway here is that we can we can say that we know that at least as far as grace is concerned that the graphic is much more um, accurate than the code is for grace. So now 
because we have two separate solutions, um, we, can, we can compare the code only solution directly to the graphic solution. And that is something we can still do for Cygnus, but we can also with Grace, we can then relate that one back to the errors associated with Grace. So up here, I have, I have shown in yellow the um, direct comparison, um, as well as keeping the errors associated with the radial cross track and in track. And you can see that by directly comparing the graphic and the code only solution that really what we're seeing when we do that is we're seeing the code only errors for grace. Um, and that in that comparison, we expect the graphic to be much better than that direct comparison. So really this allows us to place an upper bound on our graphic orbit solution, right? A really conservative upper bound um, of what we expect the graphic um, accuracy to be. So if we do that for Cygnus, we, we see we have in, um, for the radial, 5.3 centimeters radial RMS, 31 centimeters cross track, and 15 centimeters in track. Now, this 31 centimeters for the cross track is actually was, was quite surprising to us. Um, we were not expecting the cross track. Generally, the cross track is better than the, anything in the in track. And so it was unclear where this was coming from, but it seems to be related to the code only errors, right? So given that we know from the, the grace observations that the, the, the differences are dominated by the code only, that is likely true here as well. And, and to, to test this, we actually looked at um, Sentinel-6, which is um, unlike grace, which is polar, it's also inclined, um, but it's not the same inclination as sickness, but it's, it's at 66 degrees. Um, first though, so this large cross track difference, so but this is uh, the cross track um, time history of those differences. And you can see it's, it's basically, it's a once per orbit effect. And what it really is, is it's like a tiny inclination change, right? If you were to plot this versus latitude, you know, what, you know the maximum and minimum would occur at the maximum and, min and minimum latitude that Cygnus covers. If we look at the same type of thing where with, with uh, Sentinel-6, this is a, a comparison to ionosphere-free ambiguity resolved orbits, we can see that it, while not as large, there is the same code only um, structure in Sentinel-6, where it's like this tiny inclination change. And it's much less in the graphic solution compared to, to the truth orbits for Sentinel-6. Right. And so from this, we can conclude that these, these large cross-track differences between the code-only and graphic solution are, are due to the code-only solution. Now, it's unclear what the primary cause of this signal would be. Um, it may be related potentially to you know, something with the clock product or you know, the fact that the, the JPL final and IGS clock, uh, clock and orbit solutions don't apply like a code calibration to the transmitters. Not really sure exactly what the primary cause here would be, um, but it is, it is definitely something that is in the code only solution. Additionally, um, we can also look at how with grace, the orbit overlaps relate to the errors themselves. And if we do this, we can see that there's roughly, you know, radial 0.5 to 0.9 compared to the errors for the overlap 0.5 cross track, 1.1 for the errors. In track 1.2 to 2.5. It's roughly that the errors are double the overlap um, RMS values, right? So, so the overlaps are optimistic by a factor of two. If, if we extend this to Cygnus, we can we can say that our expected graphic errors are on the order of 2.8 centimeters radial, 2.4 cross track, and six centimeters in track. And this allows us to say that we, we're very confident that we have sub five centimeter radial orbit errors, which is, which is suitable for GNSS altimetry. Um, it, is, it is a very achievable accuracy with a single frequency receiver in Gypsy X. So in summary, we applied a correction to the phase observations to remove a clock-like signal that allowed us to process the graphic observable. Um, we estimated antenna calibrations for both the graphic and code-only solutions, and you know, independent for both Grace and Cygnus. 
which are then applied within the filter. And the final Cygnus orbit errors are expected to be below 10 centimeter 3D RMS. Um, this is more than an order of magnitude better than the navigation, navigation solution, which, as I mentioned before, has one Sigma 3D, posi 3D position errors on the order of three meters. So we feel very confident that we have achieved our goal of, of greatly improving the Cygnus orbit solution. So I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, so yeah, feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A. I'll, I'll, I'll start with a question. I'm not seeing any uh, so far. So um, do you see any technical obstacles to implementing something like this? So this was, a, I don't know if you mentioned how much data you process, so maybe you can mention that. And then also, uh, do you see any technical obstacles to setting something like this up to process all of the data for Cygnus? I think it should easily be, or it should be easy to automate it. Um, yeah, I, I, I did forget to mention. So this is the results I, I showed here were roughly 200 days from each, and I only used FM05 for Cygnus. So there are eight satellites that you would, you know, you could extend to the, this too. Um, I think potentially the, you know, the, the challenges associated with uh, with automating this as part of, say, the Cygnus data product would be, um, right, you'd have to get funding for it, um, and then we got special permission to access the level zero data for the um for the to get the raw observations but i don't think that that or that wouldn't be an issue the the bigger issue is like the the raw gnss observations are you know they're they're in a they are not in like a rhinex format so you'd have to set up something special to like convert everything into the gypsy x data products or into the gypsy x um, data records that it uses but it Great. should be very doable, yeah. Um, there's a question in the Q&A that says, N over two may not be an integer anymore. So how do you deal with it? So, right, because we aren't doing um, integer ambiguity resolution. So really what it is, is that the, and, I, and actually I could probably go back to that real quick. Um, we just estimate, a constant bias per continuous carrier track. So that gets absorbed within the, um, right? So whatever that half integer, right, is, is no longer, you're right, it's no longer an integer, it's, it's, it's half an integer, but that will get absorbed within this constant bias that's estimated per continuous carrier track. And that is not limited to being some sort of integer. It can, can be anything because there are other, you know, like hardware delays can also be absorbed in that as well. Great. How about cycle slips? So I did have to correct um, for some, like that That was something I, I, I right? Because I had to um, at least identify now, now like small cycle slips, um, right? Because of this phase like clock term, it, I don't know that it it's very easy to identify that, but usually like, Going through the Cygnus data, like if there was like some sort of cycle slip, it was usually huge. Like, and you could always tell that something had happened there and you would just start that as a new arc basically um, and estimate a constant bias for that. Um, yeah, that, that phase clock-like term makes it difficult to, to determine anything, you know, that's, that's much smaller. Can you go to the chart where you showed the results with the code-only solution? as well as the graphic. Uh, which one? Over Overlaps or? Um, no, I don't know what number it was. Yeah, that one. Um, 
I noticed that the results, so you mentioned that with Cygnus, the um, nav solutions were like three meter accuracy. And it looks like even with code only, you're down in the you know sub 10 centimeters. Do you want to comment on, on that? Like, is that a viable answer too? Yeah, and, and I, part of that is just that our reduced dynamics here are very, I guess, mild, right? We're, I'm not being overly aggressive in, in trying to fit the observations. And so Gypsy X has, you know, really good dynamical models. And so, right, even, even with noisier observations, like we can rely, you know, on those dynamical models and then, you know, treat them, you know, take advantage of the measurements, but not, you know, be super aggressive, right? So the, the reduced dynamics allow you to tune somewhere between dynamic and kinematic, and we're a little closer to the dynamic side of things. Um, and because of that, right, you can you can still get very good orbits with uh, the code-only or observations. Great. Um, there's a question that says, is the number of tracked satellites similar for GRACE and Cygnus? They are similar, although I think um, I think they both have 12 channels. I think uh, Cygnus has more overall. Um, like, I don't know, maybe I can show it here. Um, there is a delay for um, grace of signal acquisition. So actually, right, right, there's no measurements in this portion here. This is the direction of travel for grace. Um, Whereas, yeah, Cygnus routinely tracked observations that were way below the receiver horizon um, quite often. So I think, I think because it's a smaller spacecraft, it's easier to it, it acquires much sooner. Um, so, so they are pretty comparable, but um, Cygnus has a, a few more observations. Great. There's another question about whether there were problems with the presence of cycle slips in the carrier phase measurements, and if so, how were they detected and correlated? I think you kind of answered that already, but do you want to comment on it any more? You know, I, I never saw anything too crazy. It was like if I, I corrected for the really big ones, but I never saw anything that was, you know, small, like half cycle or, you know, like a couple cycles. Um, you know, I guess part of that I can show on the on the RMS, right, where for the graphic, right, the overall RMS, it was very consistent. And I think if if you had cycle slips that were an issue a lot of times, I think you would have seen, you know, a lot more spread on this, but, you know, it was within a few centimeters. It was totally, ex you know, what I would expect. So, uh, so I, don't, I don't think small cycle slips are really a problem for, for, or for Cygnus. There's a question about the ionospheric delay at the spacecraft altitude. Um, there's a question of, is it, is it actually zero and it depends on elevation angle, but um, if you're if you're looking straight up, like how much ionospheric delay actually is there at the spacecraft altitude? I think, right, so in, in, the, in the vertical, it's not very big up at 500 kilometers. I think it can be like half a meter. Um, for the low elevation though, it can be quite large. Um, some of the lower elevation observations they can, it can get, you know, it does need to be corrected if you want to use the lower elevation observations. I guess one thing I didn't mention is I did do, I think it was a five degree elevation cutoff just because below that it's, it's really hard to get accurate or, you know, or even decent um, ionosphere correction sometimes. Great. Um, did you look at the ionospheric activity level during this study period at all? Did you look to see if it was a high activity or low activity? If I remember right, it was it was just after solar minimum. So I think we are benefiting from the fact that that's not it's not a really highly active um, time period. Um, I do right. I do suspect that as as you got into more active solar cycle, you would you would probably see the code solution degrade, um, just because the, it's it's difficult to correct you know to accurately correct for the ionosphere. Um, Actually, there's another question oh, related yeah. to that. It's a, uh, what ionosphere correction model did you use, and have you considered using the AnyQuick with the 3D profile? So we did something very basic, right? And uh, and I'll admit it's not a a great um, method here. We just used a single IRI 
profile from 2016. And then we use the global um, ionospheric maps. So we use the profile to determine what portion of the ionosphere was above the spacecraft. And then we use the maps to determine, you know, the total electron content above the spacecraft. And then that mapped into each of the observations. So there, I think, yeah, NEQIC would definitely be much better. The only thing I would say is that, you know, given, given the results here, um, I still think, right, you could do better with the graphic. Even if you had really good ionosphere um, correction, I think the graphic is still going to beat the, the anything you could do with a code-only solution. Great. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you, Alex, for your time and preparation. Thank you also to Dr. Penny Axelrad for moderating Q&A. Penny's one of the co-authors and Alex's PhD advisor. Uh, so thank you both for, for your time, preparation, and help with today's webinar. Oh, now um, there are more questions coming oh, in. Another question came in. If you have time, we can certainly ask yeah. those, yeah. So I'm assuming they're talking about Grace, for, for the please explain a bit more how the code noise is, is filtered so much. So Grace at, you know, at three and a half centimeters graphic, which would mean seven centimeter code noise. Um, it I believe Grace is doing onboard smoothing, like carrier smoothing of the code observations. So when Grace downlinks, you have one second phase observations, but the code has been smooth to some degree on the spacecraft. And so I think that that is why you know the noise is so low for Grace. You want me to take the yeah. turn question? Um, so there's a question that says, "Do we see any effect of the sa satellite noon turn?" So in Gypsy X, it handles it takes into account the nominal attitude of the GPS satellites, and I'm assuming you're talking about phase wind up effect of something like that. So there is a nominal model in there for the motion of the GPS satellites. It's built into Gypsy X. And someone can correct me if that's not true, but I think it is. Yeah, Gypsy X, and, and I think I didn't mention, we also apply like the IGS-14 transmitter calibrations, um, which are primarily for the dual frequency phase. Um, so there may be some effects from that, but it would be small. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, thank you both. We appreciate it. We remind you that this has been recorded, will be posted to our website and our social media channels within a day or two. And thanks again. We look forward to having you all join us for a future Iowan webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.